Okay, again, welcome to everyone joining us today for this webinar hosted by the Eastern Transportation Coalition, Making Sense of CAV Data, How to Harness Today's Data for Tomorrow's CAV Deployments. We're gonna begin with just a few housekeeping items. First, we're using Zoom webinar today, um, not Zoom meeting. You may join using with your audio with either using your computer or phone, whichever works best for you. This web meeting is being recorded and a recording will be made available to participants. If you have questions about the audio or web, we're gonna ask you to reach out to Esther. And we're gonna give a, we're also gonna talk a little bit more about how we're handling questions today. So you'll notice that you have the Q&A box open. So at any point, if you have a question for one of our speakers, please type it in that box. They will either answer it in the Q&A box or we'll, it will be part of the Q&A session at the end of the uh, webinar. We have an opportunity, we may have an opportunity to have questions asked verbally. In those cases, we're gonna ask you to raise your hand. Um, but if you can put them in the, in the Q&A box, that will help us too. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa Miller. She is the Innovation Program Associate with the Eastern Transportation Commission. Great, thank, thank you, you Joanna. Joanna. We're hearing some feedback from you. There we go. How about now? Is that better? That sounds great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, and good day, everyone. Connected and automated vehicles are a key focus for agencies across the nation and across the world. And many remaining unknowns and limited resources in some cases uh, for our state transportation agencies are really challenging us on how to prepare. Next slide, please. Before we begin, just a little bit of info about the Eastern Transportation Coalition, formerly the Interstate 95 corridor. We serve 17 member states and the DC Department of Transportation. And the newest member of our coalition is the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. So welcome to anyone participating from Kentucky. Next slide, please. What do we do at the coalition? In brief, we advance the future of transportation and we connect for solutions. A smart, integrated, reliable, sustainable, and resilient multimodal transportation system is the goal. And we do that by developing in innovative and implementable ideas. We exchange best practices, test emerging technologies, and work as a coordinated corridor in a proactive way. Next slide, please. There are three different program tracks within the coalition, transportation system management and operations, intermodal freight, and innovation and transportation, which is where all things connected and automated vehicles live. And you'll notice a new entry under the innovation and transportation. We're doing a lot more with electric vehicle work right now, and it's an emerging area. Next slide, please. There's a great amount of strategic planning, workshops for learning, and members only resources available through the coalition. Here's a snapshot of the past few months of what we've been working on and what we have upcoming. There's a lot going on right now with our strategic planning for fiscal year 2023 and all of the program areas are very actively engaged in creating their work plans. Next slide, please. I'm so excited to dig in today and hear from our panelists on all things connected and automated vehicle related. We'll have presentations and then we'll have a good amount of time at the end for Q&A and discussion. So please make the most of your time today. Next slide. As Joanna mentioned, we have presenters from basically every time zone, which is pretty great. There are 265 attendees registered for the webinar from over 30 states, which is pretty amazing. So let's try hard today to engage and not have this be just another webinar. You're here, let's get the most out of it because you know you'll just file it away when the recording comes into your email inbox and you might not have time to listen to it. So really try to engage and make time for, for the webinar today. Next slide, please. All right, framing the discussion, here we go. Next slide, please. There's been an immense amount of growth throughout the coalition region, and in some cases, an outflow from urban areas to rural areas, especially with the change in workforce from COVID. 
which makes rural CAV even more important. We're not only growing in our population, but we're growing in data as well. We're already a data rich industry and there's more every single day. Today, even at lower levels of autonomy, connected cars generate around 25 gigabytes of data per hour. And um, as more self-driving features appear inside connected cars, the architecture required to make it all possible will become increasingly complex. And that's in part what we're going to be talking about today. Dr. Barber from the I-24 Motion Project and Vander Vanderbilt University shared with me before this webinar that they process, not store, process 31 petabytes of video data per year and 11 terabytes of trajectory data that is generated and shared per year. And I had to look up a petabyte, it's 1 million gigabytes or 1,024 terabytes, which is just an immense amount of data and information. Next slide, please. It's not surprising that in the spring of 2022, our Eastern Transportation Coalition CAV working groups really had these topics front of mind. The word cloud that you see on the right side of your screen, outreach, legislation, education, and electric vehicles are focus areas for all of our working groups, but you can see technology, research, data and credentialing, the SPAT challenge, MOUs and cross-border coordination are really very much front of mind. And our executive board met in early March and also had this very front of mind and the answer we're trying to, the, the question that we're trying to answer today, you know, are we ready? The coalition's work plan had some great strategic projects listed for CAV in 2022. And the work plan this year will likely be more legislation, policy, research-based and less pilot-based, but it's still an important and noticeable shift. Next change, please. Oh, excuse me, next slide, please. <clears throat> There's huge changes in our workforce. There's currently a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers in our nation and over the road trucking will be more important than ever. Automated trucking and truck platooning will be more important than ever as well. Next slide, please. Another huge change in our workforce is gender equity. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is very much front of mind in many ways and ITS America is involved in the Mobility XX initiative which seeks to increase the number of women in transportation uh, roles 10% in 10 years. And the Eastern Transportation Coalition is a very big supporter of the Mobility XX initiative. Next slide, please. How are we learning about the next steps for deploying automated vehicles and connected vehicles? There's a bit of an infrastructure cart before the horse conundrum and DOTs and public agencies are wanting to deploy, but what infrastructure is needed and what kind of readiness studies are we going to hear about in the next few years? AV readiness studies have been focused on lane striping, and you'll hear from Peter Jager from Utah DOT today. Uh, we're also partnering with Connecticut DOT, Consumer Reports, and the University of Connecticut on an automated vehicle road readiness study looking at lane markings. And I'm hearing through the grapevine that North Carolina DOT is short to follow. Next slide, please. Another style of readiness study is the documentation and understanding of the current state of the practice for AVs. Identifying agency priorities, reviewing and adapting readiness assessment frameworks, developing and testing prototypes. At the coalition, we focus on cross-jurisdiction issues, which is a critically important component of regional readiness for AVs. Next slide, please. Where do we even start that cart before the horse conundrum? Can you even drive an automated vehicle in your state? This uh, National Conference of State Legislatures database is an excellent place to go. You can break down legislation by topic, by date. It's a really great resource. And in the mid 2010s, a lot of state DOTs really started to assess um, this policy and legislation element. Next slide, please. Last but not least, because I'm a communications person at heart, I think outreach is very important. And depending on where you are in the country, Citizens have different exposures with CAP technology based on university research centers and innovation from their DOT levels and their local uh, jurisdictions, automakers engaging um, in different areas. The Minnesota Department of Transportation does a lot of public outreach through pilots and their CAP program goal is to seek trust and understanding. 
I think that's a great element to incorporate in all of our projects moving forward. Educating and informing is always an excellent way to get buy-in from the public. Pennsylvania DOT also has a great amount of CAV projects and Pittsburgh wants to secure the spot of a breakout role in autonomous systems and everything we do, whether it's Vita X data ecosystems or a pilot at the state fair is really expanding the knowledge in this CAF space. Next slide, please. Okay, without further delay, your panelists for today. Please keep in mind that the chat box is open. Go ahead and type in your questions anytime. And I'll just read the bios uh, from left to right here and then we'll get going with Peter. Peter Jager is a PEPTOE, and he's a Traffic Technology and Innovations Project Manager for the Utah Department of Transportation. Thanks for being here today with us, Peter. Peter is currently a Project Manager in the Technology and Innovation Group at UDOT, and he has over 20 years of experience in the traffic engineering field, both in the public and private sectors. Peter received a BS in Civil and Environmental Engineering from the University of Utah. Lee Smith is with us from the Tennessee Department of Transportation. Thanks, Lee, for being here today. And Lee's the Interim Director of Traffic Operations. <clears throat> Lee graduated from Tulane University in New Orleans in 1995 with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, and he became a licensed PE in 2002. After serving in the US Army post-college, Lee served in different disciplines within the civil and traffic engineering fields in the private and public sectors over the last 25 years. Lee's notable assignments are city traffic engineer with the city of Pensacola, Florida, TISMO ITS program manager with Florida DOT District 3. And in 2018, Lee joined Tennessee DOT as an assistant director of traffic operations. This role allows him to be involved in all aspects of traffic operations from TMC, safety service patrol, to ITS and signal deployments, integrating TISMO strategies throughout Tennessee and delivering safe and efficient transportation systems. And my favorite part of Lee's bio, Lee and his long suffering patient wife, Suzanne, have two kids, Natalie, age 13, and Charlie, age 10. William Barber uh, is joining us from Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Barber is a research scientist and uh, is focusing on the Institute for Software and Integrated Systems. Dr. Barber received his PhD in civil engineering from Vanderbilt and an MS degree in sustainable and resilient infrastructure systems from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a BS in biosystems engineering from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Barber had previously worked at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and CSX Transportation Dr. Barber's career and research interests focus on the application of novel and advanced computational techniques to transportation systems engineering. Thanks for being here, Will. Doug Getman, PhD, is the Director of Smart Mobility and AVCV Consulting Services for Kimley Horn. Dr. Getman has 29 years of experience in adaptive traffic control, smart city strategic planning and implement, implementation, connected vehicles, ITS management software, and transportation system modeling and simulation. Doug has been involved with CVAV standards, planning, research, and operations since 2005. Thanks, Doug, for being here with us today. And last but not least, we have Dr. Stanley Young. Uh, Stanley is also a, a PE, and Stanley is our very own Eastern Transportation Coalition Chief Data Officer. Dr. Young joined the Eastern Transportation Coalition as its Chief Data Officer in 2021, providing technical leadership to the trans tra Transportation Data Marketplace Project, as well as other new data-driven projects for the coalition. Stan is also the Mobility Systems Team Lead for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory Center for Integrated Mobility Science, and he currently leads the DOE's Technologist in Community, beginning with the Smart Columbus project in 2016, and now extending to several communities seeking to apply advanced mobile technology and data to improve sustainability and citizens' quality of life. So more than half of your panel today is a PhD, which I think is pretty fantastic. So let's ask a lot of really good questions and make sure we have an engaging opportunity today. With that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Lisa. Let me get my presentation up here. All right. 
Thank you for the introduction, Lisa. Be presenting today from UDOT, talking about our AV readiness study that we conducted last year with VSI Labs. First off, I would like to show some background about automated vehicles. Let's see. Automated vehicles use various sensor technologies, such as GPS, radar sensors, and LIDAR, and digital cameras to sense their surroundings. Whereas humans, we use our eyes to see the surroundings and make judgments. The automated vehicle has to use these various sensors to take some or all of the driving functions from the driver and make those judgment calls. Here's an example of a LiDAR image coming from the vehicle. It can see virtually all of the objects and the roadway itself, or using detection algorithms, detect the various vehicles, people, signs, and objects on the roadway. Now, Society of Automotive Engineers has assigned different levels of automation from zero to five, zero being complete zero automation, human doing all of the driving, to level five being the computer being able to drive the vehicle anytime, anywhere. Now, we're all familiar with probably the most basic automation, such as cruise control, and now we have level one and level two that are very common newer vehicles. Technologies such as lane departure warning or now lane keeping assist, which can actually keep the vehicle in the lane, not just warn you when it's departing. We are hoping to have levels three through five soon. We always hear about it from automakers about the self-driving vehicle. But we as a department are looking to get the roads ready to see if we can handle the systems on our roadways. So questions we've been asking here at UDOT, are our roads ready and what will it take to be ready for these vehicles to travel safely on our roadways. One of the major issues to consider is lane markings. In addition to signage and work zone information, and do we have enough connectivity on the roadway for these vehicles to travel and receive the information they need? And what about the roadside furniture, the overhangs, the tree shadows? How is this gonna affect a vehicle that is tested in a lab in perfect conditions? And when it gets out on a roadway in the real world, dealing with changing weather, work zones, and existing conditions, trees that have been growing for hundreds of years and casting a shadow on a sunny day. How does this all affect the, the vehicle's operations? So lane markings is what we are looking at with this current study from VSI Labs. You can see images here detecting the striping or trying to distinguish being blacked out old markings and the current white markings, how does this affect the operation of the vehicle? So back in 2016, our executive director came out with a top 10 list of goals for the department to, to challenge us. One of them was to see an automated vehicle travel the length of the state unassisted in 2021. So we use this, this test with PSI Labs to respond to that challenge, to evaluate this, this goal. Our contract with VSI Labs was to evaluate three different corridors for automated vehicle readiness. I-15 from Salt Lake City to St. George, which is about 300 miles. This is the most critical route in the state for both freight and for moving people as well as goods. It connects the West Coast shipping operations to the Intermountain West and then to points further east, as well as connecting North South all the way from Canada to Mexico. US-89 is the probably the biggest secondary route, two lane road in the rural highway in the state, connecting the population center on the Wasatch Front to the recreational areas and agricultural areas of central and southern Utah. So it was evaluated from Salina, which is in central Utah to Spanish Fork, which is at the edge of the population center, the Wasatch Front. Finally, SR 210, which is only about 10 miles long, but a very busy recreational route. It connects two ski areas, Alton and Snowbird, to the Salt Lake Valley. It's heavily used in the winter and getting to be heavily used all year round, a summer recreation growing as well. So with these three diverse routes consisted of our evaluation. Here are the survey vehicles that were used by VSI in the test. You can see various corporate logos on the doorways of the companies that were involved with the different sensing technologies, as well as all the devices on the roof, down the front and sides of the car for detection and for sensing here in front of our traffic operations center. The study was conducted in August of 2021 on a 
clear, dry, and warm day, ideal conditions. This provides a baseline for how the system will operate, being able to sense the striping and the best conditions possible. A little bit about the methodology. of So a detailed survey of the route took place using the radar, LIDAR, and other positioning systems. You can see in the image here, the passenger in the back seat, the engineer scanning the data as it comes through the computer. The driver up front is able to focus on operating the vehicle only, while an engineer in the back is monitoring the system and the data that's coming through, reading a, the stream of data, which comes through at 80 gigabytes per hour. Now, this first step is just collecting a lot of raw data, a lot of X and Y points, a lot of coordinates coming through and testing it against various automated driving algorithms. Later, the data is post-processed to, pro to determine you know, whether it, where the striping is and whether the vehicle's staying in those lines. Here's a look at the post-processing. You can see all the raw data points on the left image, green, yellow, and the blue, collecting various raw data points, comparing them against what's on the roadway using the AI and the algorithms to determine whether this staying in the lines or not. Using polyfit and linear fit methods, the striping is generated and post-processing on the right shows where the striping is placed on top of the computer image, placing the striping on top of the lines on the road. And using all this, they created a report for us, an extensive report of the entire lengths of the route showing all of the issues that were found, both good, good locations where the vehicle stayed on target and issues where the vehicle was losing or misdetecting the striping. Here's a look down Little Cottonwood Canyon, as I mentioned, one of the routes that was surveyed, the Alta Ski area. So we go through some of these data samples now and some of the examples and issues that were found. First was at Alta Ski area here. Here's a street view of the vehicles. An intersection, the road coming in on the left here, right intersection, so the striping stops at the intersection crossing, but this created a long gap in detection the vehicle was not able to sense the lanes. It looks like one line, one wide lane, and it didn't really sense the road off to the right very well either. So recommended here to have some dashed lines or some extra markings on the roadway to help the vehicle sense this intersection properly. Here on Highway 89, coming into the town of Salina, you can see the surface changes from asphalt to concrete. Now this creates a contrast issue and uh, misdetection. You can see the green and the red lines converging there where it loses good detection of the edge line. So here recommended either enhanced markers or you know, disengaging lane keeping assistance as you come into the urban area. Here's another example of an urban area where the misdetection happens because of tree shadows. And it was found, lane keeping assistance was not found to be as effective in the urban area. This is one of the reasons roadside roadside furniture, roadside buildings, tree shadows, cause issues with misdetection and not easily remedied. We're not gonna go tear down the trees just to help the automated vehicles navigate. On the other hand, we found some good examples where good striping provided perfect detection for the vehicle. Here, the, the right lane is widening for a right turn lane. Skip lines were added, dash line across the, ex the exit lane and the vehicle picked them up perfectly, both directions separating the lanes perfectly and the vehicle traveled straight through as it was intended to do. But if the striping is faded for in, the, in this example, this is on I-15, we have a skip line down the center. It's still visible as we look at it, but the sensors were not able to pick it up. So it, it looked at this as one lane, it would probably end up in the middle of the lane might be mistracking or misdetecting. So it would probably require you to re-engage steering and steer the vehicle into the correct lane. So issue where a higher contrast of center line is needed. A Couple more examples from the interstate here. Exit line diverging from the main line and it caused some confusion. The long gore area, it was not able to detect properly detect there's an exit lane there. You can see the red line curving off, showing some misdetection. 
or another example with an exolator, it's just been resurfaced. So the tabs aren't there, they're temporary markers. It looks like one big wide lane to the computer, whereas we have two lanes with an exit lane. It is, in order for this to function properly, it would need additional markings or markers on the roadway. Here's a good example of a work zone where the old markings were blacked out is the traffic's being shifted over to the right, over to the shoulder. You can see the rumble stripe and the old shoulder lane in black there. The computer properly detected the new white lines and put the vehicle right where it needed to be. So it functioned well in this work zone, shows the critical importance of having good markings, even in a temporary situation. Here's a, a bridge deck that was resurfaced. You can see the markings are not showing up right. So again, it misdetected the two separate lanes. However, in some situations we found the bridge deck resurface was short enough, the vehicle was able to stay in the lane properly because shortly after foot loss, shortly after losing the tracking, it was able to pick it up again on the other side. So fortunately, the memory is long enough to keep it on track if the gap in striping is short enough. And then further down that same road, you can see another surface contrast issue where low contrast with the white striping on the white pavement or even the yellow stripe over on the far left is not picked up well. It doesn't contrast well enough. The bright light and the white pavement need higher contrast markers to detect that. As you can see in this situation as well, concrete retaining wall off to the right, the Jersey barrier, white pavement all kind of blends together with the glare. So it lost sight of the edge line. Does not have good detection in this area. So what we found currently putting in some areas that what some people would call the tiger tail stripe where we have an alternating black and white stripe. This section in the south end of the Salt Lake Valley here as we're coming into an urban area, multiple lanes. It detected all the lanes perfectly here, tracking all the lanes with the black and white alternating, found to be very effective. The tiger tail was very effective for this situation. A few miles down the road when that tiger tail segment ended, you can see the striping starting to veer off again, the computer imagery starting to veer off to the side and the lines converging where they weren't supposed to. So. High contrast marking proved to be very effective. Another situation without it, you can see some uh, confusion in the computer sensing with two lanes diverging off to the right and is not, not sufficient contrast for it. The lines are curving when in the, not in the correct place. So in addition, with all those examples, if we wanted to look at them more closely, VSI provided not just report, but they created a, a data examination tool for us to look more closely at each situation. And you can, here's a look at static image of what this tool looks like. You can step forward frame by frame and provide us a map of the exact location of whatever the issue is. It'd be very effective. So I'm going to jump out and try to share this live so give me a sec i'll switch what i'm sharing here peter while you're doing that i'll just note that there's some great questions coming in into the chat box okay so we'll address those at the end we have a lot of great questions about weather and uh best practices and stuff like that so thank you all right you see my screen now with the data tool yep perfect back up to the start. So here's the lane marking examiner tool they provided us. You see the three different routes and two different directions for each route. We can look at each one in detail. You can enter a GPS coordinate to go to an exact site. But for example, I'm gonna to go to Little Cottonwood eastbound here. It gives us a list of all the different categories of different issues. or you can just go one by one, click on item one here. And you see a misdetection. We have curvature, curving road with a lot of tree shadows. This is in a, a canyon area. So we can go forward frame by frame. See, it was not detecting very well. Well, we got an edge line there, center line. This is an area where it really struggled through here with 
misdetections. And jumping back, show another one here. We can go by categories. We can look at the a vulnerable road user issue where they said, caution required a narrow bike lane and the detection going around the corner. You can jump back and see how the striping is tracking around the corner here. Pretty good in most situations, but uh, you know, with the curve fitting, it does. It doesn't look as good going frame by frame, right? But we do navigate around the cyclist just fine. You can look at each of the issues they highlighted in the report gives us a chance to examine them in more detail. Here's an issue where, again, where the skip line provided for the exit lane provided very good detection for us, kept the vehicles in the lane. As the right turn diverges off over to Snowbird. So, jump back to my presentation here. So some conclusions here. It's found that I-15 is generally well suited for lane keeping assistance. It may not be perfect all the way through, but there will still be disengagements at times, but most of the route, the automated vehicles are able to travel without and using the lane keeping assistance stay well within the lane. There may be a few gaps in detections of striping, whether it's a work zone or temporary situation, the resurfacing, but not always enough to disrupt the system. And this could be remedied with better mapping in the future too. High definition mapping can correct some of these deficiencies. For Highway 89, it's also found to be very suitable. Rural highways with good markings to be very suitable for lane keeping assistant. However, in urban areas, the system engaged disengaged frequently. So continuous use cannot really be expected mainly due to tree shadows, varying pavement, intersection controls, and other surrounding issues from you know, pedestrians and cyclists in the, on the road as well. So while the roads were found to be very well suited, there are some occasions for disengagement. So what's next in the future down the road? We're looking at doing another evaluation later this year to include night driving and possibly wet weather, if we can schedule that properly. Scheduling wet weather is pretty challenging in Utah, but uh, we will see what we can do. And uh, here's our website for future use. And uh, thanks for your attention. I guess jump back over to you, Lisa, for questions or our next presenter. Uh, that was great, Peter. Thanks so much. While Will and Lee get their presentation up, um, John asks a very important question, and we can certainly address this later, but it's essentially a question of readiness. You know, there's a lot of technology out there, uh, shadows and other things. Um, are we ready? Are, you know, if there, there's a lot of good discussion that, that we can have here, certainly at the end of the, the webinar. Um, and thanks, Peter, that what, what beautiful scenery in Utah. It's making me want to go on a hike. <laughs> so um, thanks so much. We'll turn it over to um, Lee and Will from uh, Tennessee to talk about the I-24 motion test bed. All right, thanks, Lisa. Uh, can everybody see uh, our presentation? Yes. Yep. All right, good deal. Uh, well, it's uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I think I speak for both Lee and myself when I say it's our pleasure to be here presenting to you today about the I twenty four motion test bed. Uh, this is a a project that's been going on for a number of years and uh, is still in its uh, development phase. Um, we're completing construction on the first phase uh, this year and uh, we'll enter sort of our uh, production and operation phase uh, towards the end of 2022. Uh, so I'll get us kicked off here uh, with a little bit of uh, motivation about the project and, uh, and some of the background. 
Um, my my background during my uh, uh, time in civil engineering is has been primarily about transportation uh, sensing and what we can do with transportation data. And in the traffic context, uh, we've been collecting traffic data uh, about uh, drivers and uh, and how traffic actually functions uh, for many years. This dates back to the 1930s with early camera sensing. Uh, and progressed into mobile or uh, progressed into sensor networks in the 2000s. Uh, California has a, a large scale uh, uh, sensor network for detecting uh, traffic at the macro scale. And with mobile phone sensing, we've uh, gotten uh, new access into uh, probe vehicles uh, in order to give us uh, a partial picture of uh, what traffic is doing at the individual driver level. However, uh, there is a, a still, <laughs> with all this sensing, there is still a need for uh, additional traffic sensing in terms of individual uh, vehicles um, and getting a comprehensive picture of the roadway. Um, so uh, individual vehicle data is very powerful because we can do uh, uh, micro uh, examinations of traffic. Uh, sort of at the microscopic level, uh, and we can also roll that up into uh, larger macro uh, uh, data about how traffic is functioning. Uh, and so this uh, is particularly important in the context of connected and automated vehicles. Uh, they're going to be changing our traffic dynamics uh, for the foreseeable future and have already started doing so today uh, with the advent of level one and level two technologies on the roadways. Uh, so understanding how these vehicles operate in mixed human and automated uh, traffic streams is going to be really important. Uh, from everything to from small interactions like the one you're seeing here uh, in this video uh, up into uh, you know, larger traffic streams composed of human and automated vehicles. Uh, these, these needs for understanding traffic are not going away and if anything, they're increasing. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Lee here to uh, to talk about uh, uh, traffic data in the context of integrated corridor management. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Our story today is a lot about you know the, the why, the what, and the how for this innovative technology. Um, so the need that's been identified that Will's talked about you know creates a unique opportunity for TDOT. Um, you know we're very supportive of research of all kinds. This is groundbreaking research that we'll be talking about today, but we benefit from this directly by being able to analyze the effectiveness of ICM, you know, integrated quarter management strategies to improve operations. So I'll talk a little bit about one of our uh, signature projects here in, in Tennessee is our I-24 smart corridor project. Um, it's one of our most congested corridors in the state. Um, travel time index, you know, over 1.5. Uh, the severity and incidence of uh, crashes is above 1500 per year, just a you know very congested corridor. And with that congestion comes traffic traffic crashes and other uh, things that really affect uh, travel time reliability. This project is intended to improve reliability and to reduce the intensity and severity, I'm sorry, the, the number and, and severity of, of crashes out there. So this is over a, a th almost a 30 mile section of I-24 that feeds into Nashville from, uh, from the Southeast here. Uh, crosses through four local agencies that we work with and partner with. Um, and it's, we've got several ICM strategies that we're in, um, including here that are brand new to Tennessee. So all the more reason to be able to study this at a vehicle by vehicle uh, trajectory level. Um, so the project is a, in some ways a classic ICM type project. We're managing a corridor with the interstate and the arterial, you know, side by side here on a, a parallel route. Um, but we're implementing um, variable, variable speed limits, lane control uh, systems, and also signal optimization, really a, an active arterial management kind of approach. We're work, working with the local agencies very closely to enhance their operations day to day, as well as being able to manage diverted traffic uh, from the interstate or from the local agency, uh, you know, from the arterial uh, with signal optimization and timing. Um, in the future, um, we're in, in the second phase of a three-phase project. Um, the variable speed limits, lane control, gantries, and the uh, signalization would be part of phase two. Um, and then ramp meters is in the, in the future for us. So 
all four of those strategies are brand new to Tennessee. So we wanted to be able to, you know, see the effectiveness on in an open road environment on what really what effect these strategies will have on on traffic. Um, so also, also, I also wanted to include, we are installing uh, over 150 RSUs out here for, you know, to be able to leverage the connected vehicle technology that's available as well. Those are DSR sheet units, which will be transitioning to CV to X over the course of the next uh, year or two. Um, but that's the other element is using not only those four strategies, but also connected vehicles to improve uh, reliability and on the corridor. So you go to the next slide there, Will. So, this is a section of I-24 um, near um, Walden Road here in, here coming up to Nashville. And you can see the effect of just the phantom, phantom traffic jam. You guys have all seen this where someone ahead of you taps their brakes and then the accordion effect starts. And you, you're backed up in traffic for some period of time and then you get up there and there's no indication there was a crash. You're like, why was I stopped? Um, not to mention you're risking that back of the queue crash, that secondary crash, just in that simple bit of, um, of traffic queuing there. You know, so the effects of the friction of the vehicles just, you know, side by side coming in and out of the uh, traffic flow there. Uh, and the innovative, really innovative part of the I-24 Motion Project is to be able to, to test in a open road live environment. That's, that's unique, we believe. And also to be able to test, you know, the vehicle by vehicle, lane by lane trajectories of those vehicles. Um, so we're looking at, from the operation standpoint, looking at look, you know, testing and analyzing um, and improving operations for incidents as well as non-incidents, you know, just the recurring congestion. Next slide there. So we talked a little bit about the why, now we're gonna start talking about the how and the what. So next slide. So this, this project, uh, just a kind of an introduction to the overall project. Um, we've got, oh, you know, basically four miles of infrastructure we're putting in. We'll be testing, we'll be using high resolution, high resolution cameras um, and looking at real world uh, applications. So, you know, the, the innovation is, is, you know, this dense installation of 4K cameras um, and being able to, you know, look at and, and um, analyze the speed, position and trajectory. That's a key word um, in what we're trying to do here with this project. Um, and so, these algorithms that Vandy is developing for not only to process this data, be able to offer it up to anybody that'd like to come test on this on this uh, test panel. Next slide. So what we're building here, we feel like is a what we call an MRI for traffic. You're able to kind of see into the traffic flow and see what how vehicles are interacting with that, and how connected vehicles are interacting with traditional vehicles, and just a you can, anything you can think of that you want to put into a live traffic stream, this system can give you that data. It's going to give you insights in, as to how those vehicles are interacting and, and how they're interacting or um, being affected by infrastructure as far as ICM strategies like the over the road gantries with the exits and arrows, variable speed limits, and then just a myriad, you know, for OEMs, other researchers. The traffic simulation community, as Will kind of indicated, is going to, is being advanced to a you know just a huge leap forward. Um, but anything you can think of, it's just such an inter interesting thing to be able to expand your mind as to whatever you'd like to test in this live environment with, on an open road test bed to be able to look at it from this angle. Um, so we want to use from an operation standpoint. Um, I'm not one of these uh, PhDs on this call. <laughs> I'm one of the guys that. Uh, tries to, to uh, affect operations more directly, but trying to look at how we can use the insights to be able to affect improving operations. Um, the data collected is great, but then the forward thinking and forward looking as how we can use these insights to improve traffic flow. And then I would just say on the operation of the test bed, we kind of talked about before with uh, Peter's uh, presentation a little bit, I think Lisa mentioned as well, the safety of this is paramount. You know, we're, we're working on procedures for any any test entity would like to come out to be able to do this in a safe, safe manner. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the, about, we've talked about the, the why, and now a little bit about the what, what piece of this. Now, Will is going to talk more about the status of the corridor and uh, about how it works. So Will, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Lee. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, as we sort of discussed, I-24 Motion sort of has two, uh, two operating modalities. One is just collecting data about how traffic functions. And the other is uh, you're really deploying experiments to the roadway and, uh, and understanding how uh, whatever you're testing is affecting traffic, uh, whether that be ICM strategies uh, or a connected or automated vehicle deployment. Um, but the, the fundamental sort of uh, data unit of all of this is uh, individual trajectory data or individual trajectory data uh, from each and every vehicle out there on the roadway. Uh, so this, this vehicle trajectory data is, uh, is not a new concept necessarily. This dates back to the early 2000s. Um, uh, NGSIM has been a fundamental data set for the traffic science community and for the simulation community. Uh, but you know it's built on a, a limited data set uh, from only uh, you know a small section of roadway in California. Uh, this has been expanded in recent years uh, by a team in Germany and recently uh, by another uh, uh, drone data set um, that cover a, a small period of time. Um, but we are uh, trying to uh, take this for take this uh, area forward by um, by an order of magnitude here and. Uh, produce over 200 million vehicle miles traveled per year of individual vehicle trajectory data. And that will be ongoing year after year. So whatever is out there uh, on the corridor, whatever's happening, uh, we are going to have data about that. And so that includes all of the uh, traffic management and all of the, uh, you know, any experimentation that is performed out there. Uh, and this uh, trajectory data feed will be made publicly available. Uh, so it's you know, not just for, for our use uh, here in Tennessee, it's uh, meant to be extensible uh, to the broader uh, transportation community, uh, just as prior data sets have, have really tried to move things forward. So you know, in order to actually make this uh, endeavor come to fruition, uh, this has been a, a multi-year effort that uh, started back in 2020. And I guess, depending on who you asked, uh, you know, started a little bit before that in terms of uh, conceptualizing uh, I-24 motion. Um, but of, of course, there was a lot of uh, planning and reporting that went on here uh, from the systems engineering analysis report to uh, business plan and data plan. Uh, all of that uh, documentation it was super uh, important in order to uh, really solidify uh, how the test bed is going to be built and how it's going to operate for years to come. And then on the physical side, uh, we uh, built a three-pole validation system, as we call it. Uh, this is really just a, a prototype of the infrastructure uh, because we are uh, making some innovations in this department uh, with adding more cameras uh, for a super high composite resolution uh, for each camera pole. Uh, and this allows us to see you know, a larger field of view than if we had just one camera uh, per pole. And so that, uh, that validation system was completed in 2020 and it's been operational since then. Um, this has been used internally for uh, data sampling and software development um, and, uh, and also from the infrastructure perspective to uh, improve upon a, the prototype and uh, build our four mile system. Uh, here's just a time lapse of uh, the construction uh, morning for the validation system. This was a uh, bright and sunny, uh, you know, Sunday. Of course, uh, we're we're lucky uh, that we got a weather gap here. Uh, all jokes aside, uh, but th these are uh, you're seeing 110 foot tall poles being stood up along the roadway. Um, in this zoomed out view, they look incredibly close together, but these are actually spaced a little bit over 500 feet apart. Uh, so. Uh, combined, they cover uh, approximately 1,500 feet of roadway in continuous camera coverage. And uh, six, six cameras per pole were placed on uh, each of these for a total of 18 cameras for the prototype system. Uh, and like we said, it's been operational since 2020. And this was one of the uh, chief innovations that was required uh, in order to make this system a reality. Uh, in order to get full roadway coverage, uh, for sort of the 500 to 600 feet uh, that each pole uh, covers, uh, we had to have multiple cameras up there. And uh, we use camera lowering device technology that allows for easy maintenance of these cameras. But the problem is that, you know, you need uh, multiple ethernet connections for these. Um, 
instead of redesigning camera lowering devices, uh, we've worked with MG Squared, uh, who makes the, the camera lowering device for this equipment. Uh, we worked with them to design what we call the Beetle, um, so named for its six legs that hold uh, six cameras up there. Um, but in, in, the, in the guts of the Beetle here, we've got a, uh, an industrial rated ethernet switch that actually allows us to transmit all of those 4K streams down the pole simultaneously across a single connection. Uh, so this, uh, this sort of innovation was, was key in making this system function. Uh, and uh, a second version of the Beetle is going to be going up uh, along the roadway uh, for the four mile stretch. Uh, the progress report as of today is that uh, construction of the four mile section uh, is underway. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see the, the construction plans here on the bottom left uh, with all 40 new poles uh, going in uh, side to side uh, for four miles continuous across I-24. Uh, these poles are 110 to 135 feet tall uh, for a total of 276 new cameras. Uh, some of those poles actually have 12 cameras per pole uh, with two uh, camera lowering devices and two beetles uh, up there in the air. And those allow us to, uh, uh, to collect trajectory data off of not only the main line of the interstate, but also the interchange on ramps and off ramps. Uh, and that's really important from a sort of holistic traffic perspective, um, because the interstate, of course, is, is affected by the boundary conditions around the interchanges. So uh, knowing uh, at, you know, vehicles about to come onto the interstate um, can, uh, can help us understand the entire situation. Um, and this is also really important for uh, integrated corridor management, uh, since the arterials are, are incredibly important in understanding the entire picture. And, uh, you know, all, all the infrastructure is, uh, is amazing and, uh, you know, it's a, a big endeavor, um, but we also have to have the back end process, data processing in order to actually get from raw video to uh, individual vehicle trajectories. And this has also been a multi-year uh, algorithm and software development endeavor, uh, but we have uh, uh, prototyped and uh, are uh, you know, continually improving uh, algorithms for high precision three-dimensional bounding boxes of individual vehicles. Uh, these are three-dimensional bounding boxes because we need uh, not just sort of the image location of the vehicle, but the uh, roadway location of the vehicle uh, defined by its footprint. So you can sort of see uh, two corresponding images over here on the right. Uh, one uh, is the view that the camera is actually seeing, and then the other is all of those trajectories and their footprint, or all of the vehicle footprints uh, overlaid on a uh, diagram of the roadway at, at, at this section. Um, and so we're getting this for each frame of video, and uh, that is sort of your time-space trajectory uh, on an individual vehicle level. So. There's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of processing and a lot of algorithmic complexity that goes into this and making it happen uh, across 276 cameras. Uh, but herein lies the importance of constructing the validation system and, and why this uh, takes multiple years to develop. Uh, here's a video from, uh, I guess this was a few months ago in uh, an early, slightly earlier version of the algorithms. Um, these, again, are under continual development, so you might see some bugs in here, but uh, that's why you start early on algorithm development. And uh, we are uh, beginning to deploy these um, in a, uh, in a uh, test environment that will eventually become the production environment for the full system of 276 cameras. Uh, so we're getting this you know, across uh, continuous four miles. So if you were actually to uh, lay out the full diagram of the roadway here, uh, this would go on for, for quite a bit. Uh, there's a server cluster that we've had to stand up at Vanderbilt to do all of this processing. Um, Lisa mentioned this earlier, but uh, you know, this is a really massive amount of data flow that is being handled here. Uh, I, I had to uh, you know, tally this up and uh, was, was pretty surprised at the, at the number we got uh, but this is uh, 31 petabytes per year of video that is ingested in this server cluster and processed. Uh, so obviously that's you know, too much to be stored in a, in a reasonable way. Um, but our, our uh, data product here is the vehicle trajectories, not the video. So the video is a means by which to get those trajectories, uh, but it's not the primary data product. Uh, and you know, moreover, 
uh, if you have individual vehicle trajectories, you don't really uh, need the video. It's more of just a, a, a way to validate that those trajectories are correct. Um, so uh, those uh, those trajectories are not a small data product uh, with you know uh, 150,000 vehicles per day, 365 days per year. Uh, you're looking at multiple terabytes of trajectory data that's generated by the testbed every year. Uh, but it is our intention to share all of that and make it available for the broader community. And Will, I was going to just mention that uh, on that last slide that this is a monumental IT networking and you know, data processing effort and our partnership TDOT has with our IT department and also the IT department over at Bandy has been instrumental. You know, this is another really huge innovation in this project, I think, just to be able to, to architect this, to set up this system, to be able to process this much data. Um, again, no, not, not a trivial effort at all. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, uh, I'll conclude with a, a slide talking about uh, the first experiment that's going to be run on I-24 Motion. Uh, so this is uh, an experiment that's been in, in uh, also in years of planning. Uh, the Circles Consortium is a group of universities, uh, which includes Vanderbilt, um, uh, but also a, a partnership between those universities, Tennessee Department of Transportation and vehicle uh, equipment manufacturers. Uh, and the, uh, as, as Lee foreshadowed earlier, uh, phantom traffic jams are a, a, a persistent uh, traffic phenomena and also a persistent uh, nuisance on our roadways um, and lead to a lot of inefficiency. And the, the Circles project seeks to put uh, uh, specially designed autonomous vehicle uh, algorithms on the roadway in live traffic uh, that will uh, smooth out some of these phantom traffic jams um, by uh, executing a, uh, a carefully designed uh, longitudinal control. Uh, so there will be 100 uh, 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 partially automated vehicles as part of the Circles project that are deployed to I-24 under the cameras uh, later this year. And uh, we hope that uh, the experiments is successful and they're able to uh, have a measurable impact on traffic. Um, and uh, such an experiment is really only possible with the ability to sense uh, every vehicle um, at the individual trajectory level um, for a, a significant uh, duration of roadway. So with that, uh, I, that's, uh, that's all we've got for you today, and we're happy to answer questions later on. Great. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Will. Um, while we're getting Doug's presentation up here, we do have a question from Sanjita about the cost of processing all the data and the, the construction. And then Russell's curious about any policies or new laws that had to be passed. Um, so if you'd like to, you could respond to those in the chat box now or we could address them at the end. And I think the takeaways from your presentation for me is that real world environment is certainly a different kind of um, opportunity to learn and explore versus a test bed. And I think making the data publicly available is going to be um, really great for data ecosystems to be able to kind of crunch that info. So thank you so much. Doug, we're all ready for you. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, first, uh, I want to say, I guess I have a lot of questions for Will, but uh, having a small role in NGSIM back in 2001, I guess not to date myself, but I'm glad to see the, <laughs> the shout out to uh, NGSIM as a sort of landmark study of trajectory data processing. Uh, one thing that was was challenging uh, in the NGSIM days, given the resolution of the cameras and the sort of maturity of the AI algorithms to do the trajectory following is stitching the camera views together. Uh, so hopefully there's been some uh, advancements there that you can take advantage of, Will, or that you've, you've developed as part of your, your work. Um, anyway, so Lisa uh, asked me not to comment on Will's presentation, but to provide some remarks and thoughts about uh, privacy and security, and maybe some of the spectrum issues that are that are sort of uh, going on right now in the connected vehicle world, sort of in the general uh, realm of you know data from connected and automated vehicles. So. Um, hopefully, I won't uh, insult too many folks, experts on the on the phone or in the webinar that probably know more than I do about some of this stuff. But just to start with some some basic definitions, uh, there's sort of three components or two components of the connected vehicle world. Uh, one is the OBU, 
Uh, that's the onboard unit, the processor that does DSRC or C veto X communications in the vehicle. Uh, sometimes if you don't have a heads up display or some kind of CV application running on the OBU, they call that's called a vehicle awareness device. And a lot of those have been deployed in uh, previous USDOT uh, supported deployments or pilots. On the infrastructure side, we call the radio, the DSRC or CBDX radio, the RSU, the roadside unit. Sometimes that's conflated with what's called the RSE, the roadside equipment. And many of the suppliers uh, these days are actually putting both of those elements into one unit uh, and mounting that on the pole to do sort of both functions. So the OBU, the vehicles, broadcast out what's called a basic safety message of BSM. And in certain situations, they can also uh, broadcast out or relay what's called a probe data message, if that's configured for the vehicle. That's not something that's uh, typically done by default. Um, on the infrastructure side, the RSE or the RSU is broadcasting what we call signal phase and timing or SPAT. Uh, it's also broadcasting out a map of the intersection, which is literally the word map. It's not an acronym for something. And then um, when it's configured, the RSE can also broadcast out what are called TIMS, Traveler Information Messages. So that's congestion ahead, uh, some kind of a roadway issue, whatever the TMC and the, the public agency, the IOO wants to broadcast out to connected vehicles. So the, the important element I think to understand about how this all works together is that there, you're not connecting to another vehicle. You're not making a physical connection. All the vehicles are broadcasting out their location, their speed, their heading and so on in these BSMs and everyone else is listening to that. So if you're not physically or sorry, uh, logically having a connection from one car to another, from the car to the roadside, it's, and I like to use the analogy of tweeting instead of instant messaging. So there are many people listening to your BSM tweets and you are listening to the tweets of, uh, of other folks. That might not be a direct analogy, but it helps to sort of set the stage that in terms of privacy and security, you're not connected to another vehicle or the roadside. Um, over the last 15 plus years, there's been a lot of standardization uh, and standards development uh, been done in the in this arena. Uh, and you can see some of the names here. I'm borrowing a graphic from uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Rob Boaz, and who's very active in the standards development community. And you can see I've no noted a couple of things that have been updated recently. So standards, uh, you know, as they're defined, uh, are typically done at the beginning of a development. So for example, NTCI, NTCIP 1202, that's been around since about 1999. And it's been continually updated over the years. Same thing with SAE J2735, that's been recently updated in 2020. So it's very it's natural and normal that standards evolve. Um, and recently, many of the key standards involved in, in uh, security and privacy uh, for connected vehicle data exchange have been updated in the last couple of years. So since 2003 or so, um, privacy has been baked into connected vehicle communications sort of from the start. Uh, and there's a few things listed on the slide here that are important. Uh, so when you turn on your ignition, if you have an OBU in your vehicle, uh, one thing that happens is it does not start broadcasting your location until it's some number of meters away from where you started. And I think there's also an alternative provision for an amount of time. So you couldn't uh, generally locate where the vehicle started. So your house or your business or whatnot. Um, the second element is that there's a random ID number that's assigned to you uh, when that OBU turns on. <clears throat> and it changes about every five minutes. So although BSMs are extremely um, uh, high frequency, so every 10th of a second you get another BSM, about every five minutes your ID number changes. So you could only conceptually track someone uh, for about that amount of time before it switches. Now, uh, practically speaking, you know, your next BSM or in a few 
seconds later, you're going to see that trajectory continue. So if you had your, see if I can point at the screen here, if, if your uh, BSM ID, or sorry, your uh, OBU ID changed somewhere in the middle here, you would then appear in the same range of the DSR, of the RSC just a few seconds later. So it's sort of obvious, like maybe that's probably the same vehicle. But regardless, there isn't any information in a BSM about your license plate number, about what kind of car you drive. There is some information about like uh, size or type, but not if you're driving in a Toyota or a Toyota Tacoma. Your VIN number is not exposed. We, no one knows who owns the vehicle. If you have insurance or not, all of that stuff is completely obfuscated in the BSM uh, information exchange. Uh, similarly, the PVD, the probe vehicle data message, has the similar privacy by design, and that's stored on, uh, on the OBU and only passed off to uh, the infrastructure when it passes an enabled RSE. So down here at the bottom, I've sort of noted what a PVD might look like. So BSMs are tenth of a second little uh, ticks about where your location, speed, and hitting are at. And then just a sample of a few of those is uh, aggregated together into a trajectory, uh, a lot like what Will was describing as being um, identified from the cameras. And that's then relayed to the infrastructure when it has a chance, when it passes an enabled RSE. So from a security perspective, okay, you've got all these BSMs, they're broadcasting out from the OBU. Um, how, is that, how is that trusted? So when you install the radio in the vehicle, it gets a bunch of what we call uh, certificates from the SCMS, the Security Credential Management System. And there's a couple of suppliers out there that provide that service. And usually in most of the pilots that I've seen, you get a couple of years worth of these certificates initially. Maybe it's a few months, maybe it's six months, but uh, the, the process of installing more certificates on the vehicles is sort of an evolving uh, thing. So typically in most of the pilots, you get a lot of those at the beginning. So that every five minutes as you're driving, those can be rotated around and to change your identity and, and help uh, provide that security. So that uh, special ID number is now certified with this SCMS secret code uh, using public key encryption so that you can trust that in the vehicle that if, if I have an OBU and you have an OBU that your, OB, that your BSMs are trusted, those are real. They're not uh, being spoofed or, or, or um, uh, some kind of malfeasance in some, in some sense. Uh, so on the infrastructure side, same thing is, is happening. The, the radio, the RSU or the RSE has a bunch of certificates, but those aren't typically rotated uh, every five or six minutes because it's a publicly owned uh, you know, device. It doesn't really need to have, be obfuscated because you can, see the, you can see where the radio is mounted on the pole. It has a fixed location. It's not going anywhere. Um, so although we do want to certify that the SPAT and MAP and TIM information coming out of a, an RSC is trusted, it doesn't really need to be uh, changed all that frequently. So one thing that always sort of perplexes me about the security and privacy discussion about connected vehicles is sort of like once the government gets involved, then uh, I've got a problem with privacy and, and security of my information. But as anybody that's got a smartphone, uh, you're being tracked by a number of apps on your phone, and that's and that's uh, sort of outside of your control. Even if you click on "I don't want my data shared," they've got ways to get around that. And so you can read some of the. This is a fairly recent uh, article by uh, Ben Lovejoy that talks about Apple. Similar thing. Uh, this study was done in 2019 by the folks that you can read there on the screen about how. Uh, different apps get around uh, security provisions and privacy protections within the Android operating system. So uh, not to raise the red flag, but it always sort of is interesting to me that, you know, sharing your information with the government seems to be bad and sharing your information without your consent to a private company doesn't seem to be all that troubling to a lot of people. Uh, this this report came out just a couple of uh, 
last week, I guess, uh, and I won't uh, go into the details of this, but the sort of the privacy and security discussion within the uh, data brokers that are uh, providing connected vehicle data from OEMs is also sort of coming under attack. So that's security issues on the OBU and, and uh, the RSE side. Once you get sort of the data back to the TMC, then these trajectories or BSMs or other information from connected, connected cars, uh, essentially we can address all the other security type issues uh, from the center to the field, from the RSE into the TDOT system or whatnot with traditional tools, uh, switch configuration, security configuration in software, firewalls uh, using uh, virtual LANs, uh, different kinds of permissions on who can see different things, uh, limitations on ports and so on. So that's not to say that it isn't a complex process because if you sort of look at uh, a representative deployment, you might have uh, you've got OBUs, you've got RSEs, you've got city traffic cabinets, you've got the city DOT TMC, you've got the state DOT TMC and sort of a, a larger pilot project or a regional deployment of this technology. And uh, it's you know, this eye chart, I'm not intending that you can read all of those lines, but you can see sort of the kinds of security configuration elements that are necessary to open certain ports and see what data is being passed between different elements of the system. And still even today, there are the, the couple of pictures of these green people is representing that some of the information is still configured or set up with what we call sometimes sneaker net. So a person has to go to a website and type in information or they have to go out to the field and install a new uh, chip or you know update the software on the RSC. So those things are all evolving. Hopefully a lot of that sort of sneaker net component of security uh, may be addressed with sort of over the air updates and things. Um, but there are all also some some good reasons to continue to have some elements of security handled by handled by people. So last last topic that Lisa asked me to touch on was uh, spectrum and uh, you know, for 5.9 gigahertz DSRC, that's been reserved for ITS use for about 20 years. Uh, so that 70 megahertz of bandwidth is chopped up into uh, seven different channels. And I liken it to you know, tuning a radio. When you go to channel one, you're listening to country. Channel two is hard rock and whatnot. In the connected vehicle world, one channel is basic safety messages. Another one, with, another one might be what's called wave service announcements or what uh, types of applications might be available at the next RC down the street, uh, things of that nature. So if you chop up the channels, or sorry, the, the whole spectrum into channels and different things are transmitted on each channel. So I'm not gonna get into the you know, political issues or <laughs> Uh, the, the variety of reasons that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration did not mandate DSRC uh, over the year, but they haven't. So there was not a strong um, reason for OEMs to install uh, OBUs on every production vehicle because they weren't forced to. Um, so in the last uh, three years, the FCC has come around and said, okay, well, we would like the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum to be split in two, uh, put the lower 45 for uh, general Wi-Fi use, unlicensed Wi-Fi, and you, you guys, they're doing CBOX, uh, DSRC can keep the upper 30 uh, for your active safety applications for B2B and V2I. And then at the same time, they also said, okay, DSRC is no longer, and we'd like you to standardize uh, only on CBUX and DSRC users, that there are a fair number out there, uh, will need to vacate that upper 30 megahertz about in the next 18 months, as it says there on the slide. So the, one of the questions is, so why did, the, why did the FCC come to this conclusion? And of course, they had a lot of political pressure from the Wi-Fi uh, community that here's this bit of bandwidth it's right next to where we sit now at 5.8, and it's mostly unused. And that's their main argument, to be to be frank. 
Uh, we've had this allocated for a long time. And yes, we have pilots now. And yes, we have thousands of connected vehicles out there today. Uh, but over the last you know, 15 years, we've been in the development mode and haven't been using that, that bandwidth um, to its best ability. Uh, also, they cited the, the you know, COVID as now all the people working from home, uh, the what are called WISPs, wireless internet service providers, particularly in rural areas, their bandwidth that is um, largely uh, sitting on top of 5.8 increased almost double as everyone was was working from home and so on. So they needed additional bandwidth to serve their customers and provide uh, essential services to, to their customer. <clears throat> the other argument is that, you know, DSRC was invented uh, probably in the mid 90s um, and CB to X is now, you know, developed on the back of uh, cell phone chipsets, which are ubiquitous and, uh, and obviously have a, much larger user base because uh, everyone essentially in the on the planet has has a cell phone. Um, and the other element is you have to pick one or the other. So you can't have a DSRC radio talk to a CB to X radio. Uh, it's very similar to the way that uh, the old GSM phone, if you had a SIM card with a GSM chip in it, could not work on a CDMA. Uh, network. So it's a very similar situation that the way the radio transmissions work is fundamentally different, even though they're in the same uh, spectrum. Uh, so you've got to pick one or the other. So I do like to say that, you know, whether or not uh, NHTSA had made a mandate, cv to x would have been developed anyway. This would have been invented. It would have been a thing. So even if we had, uh, you know, 10 million connected vehicles today, uh, we would still be faced with this decision of should we uh, drop DSRC and move on to CBOX. So uh, this is an article I just found a couple of days ago. You can see it was published uh, just on Tuesday uh, by Mr. Langtot, which talks a little bit about some of the current uh, issues related to the FCC decision and people being on one side or the other. I'm not gonna get into the <laughs> whether where I sit on that, uh, spectrum or how you should think about it, but it, it is a is a very uh, sort of timely topic. So the main question that folks typically have or are arguing about now in this FCC uh, decision is is 30 megahertz in this upper part of the 5.9 is that enough? And it's a very difficult uh, question to answer in, in just a couple of, of sentences. But without going into all, all the radio engineering uh, details, something like 200 vehicles being in proximity to each other will saturate one of those three channels, uh, just given the size of the messages and how frequently they're, they're being transmitted back and forth. <clears throat> so currently, as much as we have pilots out there and there are locations where we may have 5,000, 10,000 connected vehicles deployed, that's still extremely, extremely small component of the overall uh, background traffic that's out there. Um, and it's very difficult, even if you designed a pilot to bring vehicles together into a certain location, for example, the, um, the Umtree uh, initial safety pilot demonstration, in Ann Arbor brought all the vehicles to the University Medical Center. So that was the intention, that was on purpose. So the vehicles would all come to one spot. We can see lots and lots of interactions. But even in that situation, and with everybody going to the hospital uh, in the morning, for example, to start their shift, it's still very tough to get this sort of saturated condition where you have 200-ish vehicles that are sitting right next to each other. So if you didn't have, or even if you had a mandate today that said, uh, okay, every production vehicle in the United States will have a cb to x radio in it. That's a NHTSA requirement. Um, it would still take a long time, re relatively a long time to get to something like 50% of all the vehicles in the United States uh, that have a radio on them, just based on how people purchase new vehicles and so on. Um, so the good, the good news is that 
least in my opinion, uh, this issue with channel saturation and having 30 megahertz, only having 30 megahertz should not be cause for immediate uh, concern, at least today. So we're really talking about considerations for something like seven to 10 years from now. Uh, and another piece of good news is the 5GAA, which is the group of uh, automotive uh, folks that, that are focused on CV2X development are considering these situations now. And some of the newer uh, features of CV2X will have some provisions to handle some of this channel saturation better than it does today. And to be honest, you know, 6G is already in the development phase, right? So as we roll out 5G technology, 6G is already coming and that's uh, anticipated to actually be reallocated from where uh, CB2X sits now, 5.9 into a much higher uh, frequency spectrum because of the bandwidth and, uh, and latency requirements of, of 6G. So just to sort of finish up the discussion of this channel saturation issue, you know, here's an RSU in the middle of this uh, picture, it happens to also be uh, on I-24, which Will and Lee were, were talking about, and, and showing you sort of the, the design range of an RS, RSE, which is about 300 meters, 1,000 feet or so. That's the minimum, minimum range, but in most of the pilot deployments we've seen, uh, you get much, much better uh, reception from, from one of these radios, so you might see out double and perhaps even and uh, two and a half times as far as the design range. So if you look at what that might look like today, you know, we don't have very many connected vehicles out there. Even like, even, like I said, even if you designed a pilot to bring thousands of uh, vehicles onto the I-24 corridor at the same time, you're still only gonna see a smattering of, of vehicles within range of each other or the range of an RSE at any, at any particular time. So channel saturation and worrying about, you know, is 30 megahertz enough is, is not, a, not a concern. What's really a concern is the future, let's say six or seven years from now, uh, if I-24 is uh, two lanes in each direction, and on this, this screen here, we're looking at about um, 2,500 feet or so of roadway, in a traffic jam, you might have 150 vehicles filling the screen, four lanes, you got about 600 vehicles. If half of those vehicles had a DSR, sorry, a CV2X radio, then the channel saturation problem is, becomes, a, becomes an issue. And the question is, does that really matter? Because the fact that I can hear a vehicle that's you know 1,000 feet in front of me, that's also going two miles an hour, is that is that such a problem? You know, it's it's more about how can the vehicles sort of listen to uh, information from vehicles that are nearby, and that's some of the provisions that the 5GA group uh, is is working on today. Um, so, with that, I'm sure I've probably raised some uh, some questions from folks, uh, but I will uh, conclude and and take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. That was great. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, that, that future focus is actually my, my final question for all of the uh, panelists today. I just popped into the chat box. So um, I'd love to turn the balance of the time over to Stan, and Stan's going to take us to the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, thanks to the panelists for uh, answering all the questions that are in the chat box there and the Q&A. Uh, so Stan, please take it away. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Doug. That was a great overview, uh, something I need at least once a year to keep track of all those acronyms. Um, this is somewhat uh, kind of the closing uh, visual show once a year. If you want to find out what the state of advanced driving automated vehicles, electric vehicles are, I'd suggest you get out to the Consumer Electronics Show uh, first part of January, usually the week right before TRB, so if you want to knock yourself out. Uh, first in the Southwest and then get back to DC, uh, do so. I've been doing it for about five years now. Uh, you know, all the new model cars come out at the Detroit Auto Show, but if you want to geek out about all the new new widgets and bells and whistles, uh, usually those come out at the Consumer Electronics Show. So I, I plan to get out there and I usually spend 36 hours and just, just look at the uh, 
look at the showroom floor and geek out. Um, and these are about a, 10 slides of the highlights from 2022. Um, the biggest highlight from 2022 was COVID. It was down by 50%, which I like because half the people were gone, but uh, some of the vendors were gone as well. So here's some of the highlights that are just related to automated vehicles uh, to take note of. Uh, started out uh, the Tesla tunnel, uh, the, the, the boring company. This is their first major tunnel. Uh, definitely take a look at it if you get out there. It's not automated vehicle. They're all driven and they're just all Teslas, but they go through this white tunnel here. Uh, kind of reminds you of it's a small world ride from Disneyland. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of chatter out there if Elon Musk is going to continue to push this and, and replace all those manually driven cars with, with automated ones. So there's a great visual there uh, to take reference to. Um, next, the highlights were anything, everything, micromobility, uh, powered bikes, powered scooters, powered this, powered that. Uh, they even had a test drive show there. Uh, there's me on a couple of the test drive things. Um, you know, this was more evident than, than automated vehicles this year. That was kind of like the dominant mobility theme uh, at CES 2022. Other things, if you're looking for robotics and automation, uh, things that caught my eye is there is a lot of household robotics in years past. They'd fence them off and let you watch them do their job. This year, they'd wander around and you can interact with them. So they're really maturing. I like the one in the upper left. Of course, I went out there in January and they had an automated snowblower, just push the button and go clean off your driveway. If you look at the lower right, there's some uh, concepts there. Uh, looks an awful lot like the pods from The Incredibles. Uh, these are just concepts uh, from Hyundai. Uh, also prevalent is if you think this technology is going away, there were more LIDARs there than you could shake a stick at. Uh, LIDARs, LIDARs, LIDARs. Um, if you hear of the solid state LIDAR or the 3D or 4D LIDAR, that's, it was kind of their coming out party. A lot of interesting things there. Luminar was big. One of the themes there is, you know, things to watch for is Luminar's becoming one of these integrated providers to the OEMs. They won't just sell you a LIDAR, they'll sell you a whole subsystem that'll stop your car in this little picture right in the middle is you could ride in the Luminar vehicle and this little boy on a sled pops out and then the vehicle automatically breaks and avoids the accident. Uh, if you haven't heard, they're gonna start an Indy 500 fully autonomous. It was announced at CES 2022. I think it may be electric too, uh, I'm not sure. Electric autonomous Indy, Indy car race. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, be interesting to see the first one. Um, in reality, there was a lot more emphasis on trucks this year than there were on cars. Uh, I think the big driver shortage and the, the business case to get trucks automated was definitely there. There are several brands here. Uh, you can see uh, Rural um, Robotic Research showed up big. They have a consumer brand now, RRII. A particular note, if you may have heard of Too Simple, they're trying to get an automated business model going to go across the lower um, the lower parts of the states, and they recently had a huge infusion of cash, so they had a huge booth, and you could see what was going on there. Uh, the other major theme was a uh, EVs, not AVs, electrified vehicles. Um, there, there, there were brands you may recognize some of these, you may not. Um, brands, uh, Sony's getting into the app, Tog, Indigo, uh, Fisker, and I forget what the one in the upper, v, Vinfast. Uh, so the, the there were more examples and more energy in getting things to run on electricity uh, in the light duty space than there was in, in the automating them uh, as there have been in past years. Uh, anything and everything about batteries was popular. Uh, various charging things. My favorite was the split bolt down in the lower right. If you have a dryer plug, you just use this little device. You can dry your clothes and charge your EV and without blowing the fuse. Uh, and I included this in the upper right. Where else in the world can you dress up like an element of a periodic table and be the life of the party? You can see there's gallium arsenic or something like that. It's quite a cute little show. Um, Hyundai, there were a lot of robots there. And if you follow the news, Hyundai bought out Boston Dynamics. And so they had their, uh, their little dog-like pet uh, doing several demonstrations. They had several mobility. These are all concepts. These are not products uh, in this particular one. Uh, but definitely a, a huge amount of robotics in, in automation in this space. Um, this is kind of following up. 
if, if you like tractors, then there's nothing cooler than a John Deere. Well, maybe except an automated John Deere. And John Deere had a huge show there in this big old planter, harvester, whatever it was. I could even operate it. I guess you just hit the green button and go and hopefully it is fully automated because I wouldn't know how to drive it otherwise. Uh, so that that's kind of cool. So there's a little taste. Uh, if you get the opportunity, it's usually quite inexpensive. Uh, and it does give you a kind of a benchmark on where industries at uh, it, with respect to automation and a lot with respect to electrification across many uh, industry sectors. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Stan. As a former Midwesterner, I'm super excited about the automated John Deere's because uh, Peter mentioned before vul vulnerable road users. I'm also a Harley rider. So passing one of those on a rural road is, is a little challenging for me. Um, Special thanks to all of our panelists today. We will make the slides available for you uh, following the webinar. And um, I'll close with Lee's comment that he put into the chat box here. So <laughs> what does the next five years look like? Uh, the next five years should focus on safety applications and ways to improve operations. And the industry needs to focus more because the technology is moving fast and leaving applications and operations behind in some cases. And of course, in individual opinions there, uh, but something that I very much agree with and I think is gonna be front of mind for our discussions as we continue. So we'll conclude. Uh, thank you also to Joanna and Esther for helping us to facilitate today. Have a good day, everyone.